For Black History Month 2021, Opera House players would like to tell nine stories of people of color, chosen because of their relative obscurity, importance, and their challenge of the myth of the token black. Black History Month honors the contributions of African Americans to U.S. history. There are the famous black Americans that we know through that little section in our history books in elementary school. We know about Rosa and Louie and Martin because their stories get told as staples. Yes, their stories should be in the spotlight. Yes, they demolished barriers. But there is so much to tell among Black America, so many unsung pioneers. Like Matthew Henson, who told his story and demanded recognition, while Henrietta Lacks proved that she was essential simply because her existence made medical breakthroughs that we can't live without. Black history doesn't begin and end with the stories you've been told at school. They only scratch the surface of the greatness that we are capable of. James Tillman was wrongfully accused of assaulting a white woman and incarcerated for almost two decades before being the first person in Connecticut to be exonerated based on DNA testing. James grew up in Hartford, Connecticut and is the model for the character of Daniel Farmer in a play called Conviction, written by Alan Kramer. In the early morning hours of January 22nd, 1988, the 26-year-old victim was warming up her car in the parking lot in Hartford when a stranger pushed his way into her car. He drove her to a secluded spot where he beat her, robbed her of her money and jewelry, and raped her. The attacker then drove to a different location and ran off. Semen was found in the victim's pantyhose and dress. A forensic analyst testified that the testing showed that the semen could have came from Tillman in about 20% of the male population. The analyst failed to note the possibility of Duration, however, which have changed the results. A rape kit had been collected at the hospital after the crime, but the samples in the kit were not tested at the time of the trial. Tillman steadily maintained his innocence but was convicted after a jury trial of all charges on September 9, 1989. The conviction was based almost entirely upon the eyewitness identification of the victim, a white woman who was unknown to Tillman. It was the word of a white woman against a black man, in 1990, Tillman arranged to have stains from the woman's pantyhose and dress tested, but DNA tested at the time was not advanced enough to give a conclusive result. Having spent 18 and a half years of his life in prison for a crime he didn't commit, more advanced DNA testing was performed on the sample of the victim's pantyhose. Tillman was also excluded from all of the semen samples, and all of the samples matched one another, meaning the semen was from a single source. On January 6, 2006, Tillman's convictions was stayed after the Superior Court grants the petition for a new trial based on DNA evidence. Tillman was released without a bail. Since being released from prison in 2006, thanks to the efforts of the Connecticut Innocence Project, James has earned an associate's degree in human services from Goodwin University. He is now the proud owner of a genuine automotive in East Hartford. James fully participated in the development of conviction of play based on his life with playwright Alan Kramer. While Alan's accomplishments in his career are astounding to behold, we'd like to take a moment to thank him for being an ally in telling James' story. Thank you. In 1706, an enslaved West African man was purchased for the prominent Puritan minister Cotton Mather by his congregation. Mather gave him the name Onesimus after the enslaved man in the Bible. He introduced the practice of inoculation to colonial Boston. By 1721, the smallpox epidemic was in full swing, killing hundreds. Smallpox was one of the era's deadliest afflictions among colonists and Native Americans alike. It decimated Native communities that, with no immunity, were unable to fight it. The virus was extremely contagious spreading like wildfire in large epidemics. Smallpox patients experienced fever, fatigue, and a rash that could leave disfiguring scars. In up to 30% of cases, it was fatal. 
A Boston advertisement for a cargo of about 250 enslaved people recently arrived from Africa around 1700, particularly stressing that the enslaved people are free of smallpox, having been quarantined on their ship, and there seemed to be a reason. Onesimus knew about an early immunity procedure, and he shared with Mather that he knew how to prevent smallpox. Onesimus, who is a pretty intelligent fellow, Mather wrote, told him that he had had smallpox and then hadn't. Onesimus said that he had undergone an operation which had given him something of a smallpox. It would forever preserve him from it. And whoever had the courage to use it was forever free of the fear of contagion. The operation Onesimus referred to consisted of rubbing pus from an infected person into an open wound on the arm. Once the infected material was introduced into the body, the person who underwent the procedure was inoculated against smallpox. After an unpopular start, in 1721, Mather and Zadiel Boylston, the only physician in Boston who supported the technique, got their chance to test the power of inoculation. Out of the 242 people inoculated, only six died. The smallpox epidemic wiped out 844 people in Boston. Eventually, smallpox vaccination became mandatory in Massachusetts. In 1980, the World Health Organization declared smallpox entirely eradicated due to the spread of immunization worldwide. It remains the only infectious disease to have been entirely wiped out. On April 6, 1909, U.S. citizens Matthew Alexander Henson and Robert Edwin Perry, along with four Inuit assistants, became the first humans to set foot on the North Pole. Henson and Perry have been attempting to reach the pole for the past 18 years. Henson is credited with being the first group to reach the North Pole. Matthew Henson was born in Charles County, Maryland in 1866. His parents were sharecroppers, like many African Americans in the post-Civil War years. Both died during Henson's childhood. At the age of 12, he went to work as a cabin boy on a merchant slip, having been fascinated by the stories of the sea. Aboard the ship for six years, he learned how to write, read, and navigate. Later, while working as a clerk in Washington, D.C. hat shop, he met Commander Robert E. Perry, who was planning a surveying expedition to Nicaragua. Upon learning of Henson's sailing and navigation experience, Perry hired him as a valet. On the 1888 Nicaragua expedition, Henson impressed Perry and subsequently accompanied him on seven Arctic expeditions between 1891 and 1909. In 1912, Henson published an account of experiences, a Nicaragua explorer at the North Pole, and he gave lectures throughout the country. Compared to Perry, However, he received relatively little immediate recognition for his part in the 1909 expedition to the North Pole. He spent the remainder of his career working as a clerk at the U.S. Customs House in New York City. Late in his life, Henson received some long overdue honors. The prestigious Explorers Club finally admitted him as a member. In 1937, Congress awarded him the Perry Polar Expedition Medal in 1944 and President Harry S. Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower welcomed him to the White House. After his death in 1955, Matthew Henson was buried at a New York Woodlawn Cemetery. In 1987, at the request of Dr. S. Allen Counter of Harvard University, a neurobiologist, explorer, and expert on Henson, President Ronald Reagan granted an exception to the Arlington National Cemetery burial policy, allowing for the bodies of Henson and his wife, Lucy Ross Henson to be entered into Arlington with full military honors in 1988. The National Geographic Society awarded Henson the Hubbard Medal, its highest honor. The medal represents the ultimate national recognition that Henson has so long deserved. He even solidified his place in history as a character in the much beloved Broadway musical Ragtime by just having been himself.
Anna Louise James. Anna Louise James was born on January 19, 1886 in Hartford. The daughter of a Virginia plantation slave who escaped to Connecticut, she grew up in Old Saybrook. Dedicating her early life to education, Anna became in 1908 the first African-American woman to graduate from the Brooklyn College of Pharmacy in New York. She operated a drugstore in Hartford until 1911. When she went to work for her brother-in-law at his pharmacy, making her the first female African-American pharmacist in the state. The pharmacy where James worked started out as a general store for the Humphrey Pratt Tavern in 1790. The store moved to its current location at the corner of Pennywise Lane in 1877, where it became Lane Pharmacy. Peter Lane, one of only two Black pharmacists in early Connecticut, added a soda fountain to his establishment in 1896. When Peter got called away to fight in World War I, he left the pharmacy in the care of his sister-in-law, Anna Louise James. In 1917, Anna took over the operation and renamed her business, James Pharmacy. Anna, known to local residents as Miss James, operated the business until 1967. Although the building has changed owners numerous times over the years, the former pharmacy, now primarily an ice cream shop, retains much of the character James instilled in it. The shop still utilizes some of the original cabinetry, tables, chairs, and marble countertops as well as a 1940s milkshake machine. In the 1990s, AT&T featured the James Pharmacy Building in one of its television commercials. The building also received recognition as part of a documentary on local resident Catherine Hepburn. In 1994, the James Pharmacy received a listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Mary Liza Mahoney became the first professionally qualified black nurse in 1879. Besides being acknowledged as an excellent nurse, she continued throughout her life, making her mark as an activist for the rights of minority nurses and women. Mary Liza Mahoney was born on May 7, 1845, in Dorchester, Massachusetts, to freed slave parents who had moved north wanting to live in an environment with less racial discrimination. Mahoney's small stature, weighing in around 90 pounds, did not limit her energy and drive. She was a deeply religious woman, which was also the reason why she aspired from a young age to become a nurse. Mahoney started work at the New England Hospital for Women and Children at the age of 18 and worked there for 15 years as a cook, maid, and washerwoman before starting her training as a nurse. At the age of 33, Mahoney was the first black woman to be accepted into the hospital's 16-month training program in 1878. New England Hospital for Women and Children was the first institution in the U.S. to introduce a formal nursing training course in 1872. The hospital was founded and staffed entirely by women physicians. Out of a class of 40, Mary Eliza Mahoney graduated as one of the only four students to complete this intensive program and became the first black professionally qualified nurse. For the next 30 years, she worked mainly as a private duty nurse in the homes of wealthy white families. She was praised for her efficiency and calm approach and her reputation spread to the extent that they received calls for her services from across many U.S. states, including Massachusetts, New Jersey, Washington, and North Carolina. 
Throughout her career, she took pride in her work, driven by the belief that it was important to prove that there was no place for discrimination in the nursing profession. From 1911 to 1912, at age 66, Mahoney took up the position of supervisor at the Howard Orphan Asylum for Black Children in New York, after which she retired. Mahoney was active in nursing organizations, and it had been said that she seldom missed a national nurses meeting. In 1896, she became one of the first black members of the Nurses Associated Alumni of the United States and Canada, later renamed the American Nurses Association. Mary Eliza recognized the importance for nurses to stand together in improving the status of blacks in the profession. She was the co-finder of the National Association for Colored Graduate Nurses, an organization which the aim of advancing the interests of colored nurses and eliminating racial discrimination in the profession. At the first NACGM convention in 1909, Mahoney delivered the welcome address in which she made a passionate plea against inequalities in the nursing education, called for demonstrations to have more African-American students admitted to the nursing. At the age of 76, she was one of the first women in Boston who registered to vote. After the passing of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, in her honor, the NACGN established the Mary Mahoney Award in 1936 to recognize contributions to advancing the interests of black nurses. The medal was continued after the organization emerged with the ANA in 1951. Today, the ANA presents the award in recognition of an individual nurse or group of nurses for special efforts they have made towards increasing diversity and inclusion within the nursing profession. Mahoney was inducted into the American Nurses Hall of Fame in 1976 into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1993. So many of her renditions remain the standards by which all others are judged. The genius of her pirate Jenny to I need a little sugar in my bowl. From to be young, gifted, and black, I got life to last but not least, feeling good, Nina has been imitated but never duplicated. Dr. Nina Simone was born on February 21st, 1933. At the age of three, Nina Simone, born Eunice Kathleen Wayman, began playing the piano by ear. Her talent was undeniable and she could play almost anything she heard on the piano. Her parents allowed her to play the piano at her mother's church. Soon she began studying classical piano with Muriel Mazanovich, who was living in the town of Tyron, North Carolina, where Nina Simone was born and raised. Under Mazanovich's instruction, Nina became well-versed in the classical music of Johann Sebastian Bach, whose style she fused with pop, jazz, and gospel to create her unique sound. During the civil rights era, her music reflected the anger that she and other Black Americans felt as they fought for their freedom and rights. The existence of racism had been obvious to Dr. Simone at a young age. She studied at Juilliard in New York, was valedictorian of her class in high school, and was denied admission to the Curtis Institute of Music because she was Black. In the 1960s, Simone became a friend of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and performed at civil rights demonstrations. Her 1964 song, Mississippi Goddamn, exemplifies this period. Her popularity grew as she added folk and gospel selections, as well as songs by the Bee Gees, Bob Dylan, and Screamin' Jay Hawkins to her repertoire. Angered by American racism, she left the United States in 1973 and lived in Barbados in Africa. She settled in France, where she released her final album, 1993's A Single Woman, which featured French lyrics alongside pop covers from the likes of Prince and the Beatles. Simone went on to record more than 40 albums, earning four Grammy Award nominations and receiving a Grammy Hall of Fame Award in 2002 for her work. Additionally, she received three honorary degrees from Malcolm X College and Amherst College, the third was granted nine days before she died 
from the school that rejected her, the Curtis Institute of Music. Dr. Nina Simone was arguably one of the most extraordinary artists of the 20th century, an icon of American music. She was the consummate musical storyteller who used her remarkable talent to create a legacy of liberation, empowerment, passion, and love through a magnificent body of work. She earned the moniker High Priestess of Soul, for she could weave a spell so seductive and hypnotic that the listener lost track of time and space as they became absorbed in the moment. A 1980 Chanel television commercial that included her vocal, My Baby Just Cares For Me, helped introduce her to many new and young listeners. A similar rebirth occurred in the 21st century when her 1965 recording of Sinner Man was remixed as an electronic dance music standard. Despite ill health, she continued to tour and perform, and she maintained a devoted international following until her death in 2003. In 1951, a young mother of five named Henrietta Lacks visited the Johns Hopkins Hospital complaining of vaginal bleeding. Upon examination, renowned gynecologist Dr. Howard Jones discovered a large malignant tumor on her cervix. At the time, this hospital was one of only a few to treat poor African Americans. As medical records show, Ms. Lacks began undergoing radium treatment for her cervical cancer. This was the best medical treatment available at the time for this terrible disease. A sample of her cancer cells retrieved during a biopsy were sent to Dr. George Gay's nearby tissue lab. For years, Dr. Gay, who was a prominent cancer and virus researcher, had been collecting cells from all patients who came to the hospital with cervical cancer. But each sample quickly died in Dr. Gay's lab. What he would soon discover was that Ms. Lack's cells were unlike any of the others he had ever seen. Where other cells would die, Slack cells doubled every 20 to 24 hours. These tissue samples were stolen and used to create the first ever immortalized cell line called HeLa. Lax was not compensated in any type of way. When she died in 1951, George Gay and his lab assistant Mary took more tissue from her body while she was in the hospital's autopsy facility. Gay was able to repeatedly divide one cell to use in multiple experiments and eventually the HeLa cells were being sold commercially to other labs and research facilities. HeLa cells helped Jonas Salk develop the polo vaccine and they have been used in research into AIDS, cancer, gene mapping and more. They were also the first human cells to be successfully cloned in 1955. Allergy tests have been conducted on the cells to test everything from makeup and cosmetics to glue. In 1996, Morehouse School of Medicine honored Henrietta Lacks and her cell line, as well as the contributions of African Americans in medical research at the first ever Gila Women's Health Conference. In 2010, John Hopkins Institute for Clinical and Transitional Research created an annual Henrietta Lacks Memorial Lecture Series in honor of the global contribution of HeLa cells. While this terrible slight and acknowledgement will go down in history, so will our efforts in thanking this amazing woman for some of the most monumental scientific advancements in history. May her family get the honor, the respect, the awareness from the world that they deserve. Frank Mann was Howard Hughes' top engineer, lifelong best friend, and hidden genius behind much of Howard Hughes' success in the world of aviation and mechanics. Born November 22, 1908, the African-American engineer was known for his participation in many Howard Hughes' projects, including the Spruce Goose. He also starred in the Amos and Andy radio show. Apparently, his lifelong friendship with Hughes was instrumental in opening doors for a man's exceptional talents. A native of Houston, Texas, Frank Calvin Mann's parents wanted him to become a school teacher. But from childhood, he had a natural ability to fix things. At age 11, he had his own mechanic shop. As a teenager, he worked alongside airplane mechanics, repairing engines. By the age of 20, he had designed and built several of his own Model T cars. 
It was unheard of in the 1920s for a black man to have anything to do with cars, trains, or airplanes. Mann attended the University of Minnesota and UCLA where he earned a mechanical engineering degree. World War II equipment that revolutionized military weaponry would not exist if not for his involvement. Incredibly, few Americans are aware of Frank Mann. He was the first black commercial pilot for American Airways. He was also a distinguished military officer. In 1935, following Italy's invasion of Ethiopia, Frank Mann flew reconnaissance missions for the Ethiopian army. He served in the World War II Army Air Corps and was the primary civilian instructor of the famous Tuskegee Airmen in 1941. He left Tuskegee after a rift with the U.S. government, which didn't want the squadron, an all-black unit, flying the same high caliber of airplanes as their white counterparts. An angry man had refused to have his men fly old World War I biplane crates because his airmen had proven themselves as equals. Though they were given inferior equipment and materials, their squadron never lost a plane, bomber, or pilot, and they were nicknamed the Red Tails. After the war, Mann was instrumental in designing the first Buick LeSabre automobile and the first communication satellite launched for commercial use. His pride and joy was a miniature locomotive enshrined in the Smithsonian Institute. We hope that the future honors him in death as he was not always in life. Valerie Thomas's interests in math and science were not encouraged until her college years. After graduating with a degree in chemistry, Thomas accepted a position at NASA. She remained there until her retirement in 1995. During that time, Thomas received a patent for an illusion transmitter and contributed broadly to the organization's research efforts. Valerie Thomas was born in February 1943 in Maryland. Fascinated by technology from a young age, Thomas was not encouraged to explore science. At the age of eight, she checked a book called The Boy's First Book on Electronics out of the local library. Her father would not work on any of the projects with his daughter, despite his own interest in electronics. After graduating from high school, Thomas finally got a chance to explore her interest as a student at Morgan State University. She was one of only two women at Morgan to major in physics. Thomas excelled in her studies. She graduated from Morgan and accepted a position as a data analyst at NASA. Thomas grew to be a valued NASA employee. In the 1970s, she managed the development of the image processing systems for Landcast, the first satellite to send images to the Earth from space. In 1980, Thomas received a patent for an illusion transmitter, which is used to share images between space and Earth. It's used by NASA until this day. This invention also enabled the creation of 3D and virtual video screens utilized in television and extensive surgeries. Until her retirement from NASA, Thomas contributed widely to the study of space. She helped to develop computer program designs that supported research on Halley's Comet, the ozone layer, and satellite technology. She held several positions, including project manager of the Space Physics Analysis Network and Associate Chief of the Space Science Data Operations Office. For her achievements, 
Thomas received several NASA awards, including the Goddard Space Flight Center Award of Merit and the NASA Equal Opportunity Medal. Her success as a scientist, despite the lack of early support for her interest, inspired Thomas to reach out to students. In addition to her work at NASA, she mentored youth through the National Technical Association in Science, Mathematics, Aerospace Research, and Technology Incorporated. Black History Month began as Negro History Week in 1926. It became a month-long celebration in 1976, and the month of February was chosen to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. The week came almost 150 years after the first Black invention is recognized. From serving a country that has historically disenfranchised us, to being trailblazers in medicine, to being standout engineers, educators, and entertainers, keeping people of color down has never kept us out of the game. May the game changers highlighted here inspire you to make every month Black History Month. It's not just our history, it's your history too.